Alison Starkey and I'm the Communications and Marketing Officer at SRA. Um, today, Chris Norris from Norris Energy Crop Technology will be presenting on the topic of machine cane interactions. What is the impact of front end design and harvest operation on product quality and crop returning? And the webinar will consist of for around about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session for 15 minutes or so. Uh, during the presentation, we ask that all microphones are on mute. Uh, however, you can type questions via the chat function at any time if you'd like to during the webinar. So if you're not familiar with that, there's a little speech bubble uh, icon on the top bar um, at, the, at the top of your screen. It's the second one from the left. If you open that up, you can see the chat that's already uh, got a few people making comments in there. Um, and uh, so Chris might hold on to your questions until the end and answer it during the Q&A. During the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question, you could either type it into the chat or you can raise your hand um, using the little hand icon that's also located at the top there. Uh, you obviously, you'll need to unmute your microphone to ask a question when prompted and then we ask if you can remute. At the um, completion of today's webinar, we will upload it to our website, as I've said. So to introduce Chris, um, he's an agricultural engineer with over 40 years experience. He has got um, significant experience in R&D, culminating in managing the BSES harvesting research program and the associated uh, group of engineers in the late 1990s to early 2000s. During this time, significant work was done on harvester front end design, some of which was adopted by harvester manufacturers. Now I do have quite a bit of background noise. I think that's it, so thank you. Um, so Chris went on to work for uh, Booker Tate as part of their technical support team. Um, this work involved optimising harvester operations at their estates overseas, as well as the introduction of new farming systems. In 2010, he joined Norris ECT, where his focus is on reducing harvester losses. The project to be discussed today was undertaken in conjunction with QUT. Uh, and I'd like to now hand over to Chris. So Chris, you, I should, um, you should be able to start sharing and your, your screen share will overtake my screen share. Okay, is that got it all, everybody? Thanks, Alison. Um, okay. I'm not seeing your, sorry, I'm not seeing your screen yet. Maybe other people are. See that? Not no. yet. Okay. Mm. Houston, we have a problem. Display settings, share touch bar, and slide share. There's that, this. that uh, button on the on the far right of the strip that's got the square with the arrow pointing up. Yes, Can yeah, you point down, yeah. Go back to that. Uh, it looks like, yep, now that's great. So if you just put it into presentation mode, we're right to roll. Thank you. We're away to roll. We're great now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I won't go into that long topic of the um, of, of the presentation, but um, the project was um, started as part of the Commonwealth government funding that went to um, to be to SRA um, with a number of uh, with an emphasis on a number of harvesting projects. Um, the aim of this project was to minimise uh, losses and crop fuel damage by a combination of um, adoption of relevant technology and demonstration of improved technology. Um, how well we went is, yeah. Okay, the project team, there was us, um, basically me, Stuart, uh, Cam Whiting helping us, and then there was QUT part of the, comp of the work, which was looking at modelling the front end of the harvester and uh, looking at the machine crop interfaces from a, a modelling point of view. Uh, as I said, the funding was under the R&D, Rural R&D for Profit program, um, and the project started in March 2017. Okay, so I, I want to go through the, the rationale for the project and a fair bit of background to start with before we get into what we actually did in the project. So we know in the last 20 years, there's been a, a very dramatic increase in the um, area harvested per harvester. You know, in some areas, there's been about a halving of the number of harvesters. 
um, in all areas, the way that, you know, there's been a very substantial increase in harvesting speeds. The question is, has this impacted on the industry and in particular on our yields? There's a, a, a lot of debate on that. Some people say not an issue, we can go fast. Other people say, oh, we're not, we're, we're having recruiting problems. If we look at uh, the Australian industry, but I'm focusing here on Herbert data because I've got a lot of data there. Um, this is a, a graph showing the yield, clean cane yield, our delivered cane yield, an estimated clean cane component of that for the Herbert up to you know, the, this early 1980s or late mid, mid 90s. 1970s, sorry. Around this time, we have the introduction of machine harvesting and we start to get the plateauing effect uh, in yields. We also know then from about here somewhere, harvesting, the, the number of harvesting units started to decrease from their peak around um, 2000 coming down. And what we see is a, a very low, small reduction in total delivered yield. But if we look at the clean cane yield, we have a much more dramatic reduction in yield which has occurred over this period. The question is, is that causative or simply associative? Is the harvesting speed issue causative or, or simply associative? Is there any relationship or it just happened? Um, interesting to look at some other data. This is uh, an estate, Kanana estate in Sudan that we were doing work in in the period of uh, 2000. 11 through to 2013. Basically what happened is that they were harvesting um, up to about 2008, they were harvesting their second and third returns by machine and everything else was being hand cut. With the secession of South Sudan, they had a major shortage and coming up of, um, of labor for, for cane cutting. And so they made the decision in 2008 to go full machine harvesting. If we look at their yields from then on, um, it was a downhill slope. In fact, uh, production fell from you know, an average of 3.6 million tonne in 2013, um, sorry, from 4.1 million tonne in, in 2008 to 3.6 million tonne in 2013. And that was despite an increase in about 10% in their cropped area. And I, I guess we can say that then certainly that was more than an associative effect uh, that machine harvesting did have a big impact there on what their yields were. Now we know also that, yeah, okay, they introduced machine harvesting into a 1.5 metre farming system and in their soil type soil compaction was a major issue, but there were other issues as well. I guess if we look at the front of a harvester and the interactions um, as to how a harvesting operation can impact on return damage and returnability of a crop. Um, we've got the machine coming along and inter inter interacting with, with the crop. Uh, the crop dividers, their job is to basically, in, an, in a lodged crop or sprawl crop, is to actually untangle and align the crop. The knockdown and fin rollers, which are these guys here, their job is to actually then act make the material feed up into the throat of the machine across the base cutters and in, in, you know, as far as partially into the feed train uh, because the, the material has to be well and truly into the feed train before it's, it's, it's pulled properly. And then during this process, the base cutters are severing the store. So there was a fair amount of research undertaken in the late 90s on improving the front end of the harvest. I was heavily involved in that work. Uh, at a similar time, Sander Crows was doing his PhD on, on base cutters and there was subsequent work done as well. So all this work indicated that the status quo of the harvest, the, you know, the way the harvests were set up, were pretty suboptimal, and that potentially there were some fairly big gains which could be made. <laughs> what we can be fairly sure of is that the increase in harvesting speed since this work was done can be anticipated to have pretty much exacerbated many of the identified problems. So, have the front end issues actually impacted on return yield? Again, I said this a bit contentious. There have been a number of trials done where people have just looked at changing harvesting speed and they've generally given pretty inconsistent or limited results. So changing speed alone seems to have little impact. The issue is, is clearly more complex. We can go to some of the work. Um, we know that many mills now use electronic consignment to plot harvested area. Um, the loggers for that allow harvesting speed to be recorded for each block. 
plus we have the yield and so on on a year-to-year -year basis, harvesting speed on a year-to-year -year basis. And so therefore we've got the delivered yield, field area, that allows our, our tonnes per hectare on a year-to-year -year basis to be compared against harvest and speed or whatever. Some work that Alan Garside did in um, the Herbert back in 2010 or 2011, what he found was that, um, that harvesting in fact did have a big impact on the yield of the following crop. In fact, his suggestion was that analysis of the harvesting losses in the current crop and harvesting practice on the productivity of the next crop needs to be continued and expanded. He said was a critical area of investigation. Now, in the recent survey that we were involved in with SRA on harvesting and farming systems programs, there were a very large number of growers who said, oh, we need varieties that, re that return better. So clearly the industry sees that returning is an issue. If we look at the analysis of some of the, of the Herbert data that was done by Joe Stringer and, co and group, um, what that indicates strongly is that as our pour rate now increased, um, there's definitely you know, the, the yield of the, for example, the 2012 crop relative to the 2013 crop. Uh, um, sorry. Yeah, the relative yield of, of those crops fell the higher the harvesting pour rate, and that was a consistent effect. So what we can say is that as the pour rate increased, there was a consistent trend, trend of depression in the yield of the subsequent return yield. Now, the other thing that was significant is that the impact was pour rate rather than ground speed. Ground speed was important, but pour rate was much more important. And so that what that showed us is that crop size was also an important factor. And also that tells us that gathering and feeding function of the harvesters uh, are also important as well as base cutting in terms of the impact on next year's crop. So from this, the primary impacts of harvesting for this project, we wanted to look at really gathering, well, the things that were obviously important, uh, the gathering and feeding, or the gathering rather, the knockdown and feeding and base cutting are all really important if we're looking at the impact of harvesting on next year's crop. Just looking at those types of um, damage in more detail, the gathering, feeding, base cutting. Um, the, the, the spirals, again, align the, align the crop. And so as they attempt to align the crop, they're actually pulling or, or, or you know, getting under the crop, trying to pull it in to align it to be parallel with the harvester, the line of the harvester. And there tends to be a, a fair bit of, um, you know, they're, they're actually bending the crop as they do that. And there's also typically a fair bit of, um, of tension put on the crop stool because it's trying to stay anchored as, as the crop is being pulled into the throat of the harvester. And we sort of see this, you stop a harvester and take some photos and you can see areas of damage to the crop already. That's just in the top couple of, couple of stalks. And if you dig it away, you'll find damage all the way down through. And so if we want to understand how important this is or how much is likely to happen, we need to just have a look at, um, go out to the side for a bit and look at how much you can bend a stalk of cane before it actually fails. And again, some of the work that Santa Crows did for his base cutter work he was looking at how far you could bend the stalk of cane before it broke. Um, what he found that the important thing was that irrespective of the variety or whatever, how much you could stretch the outer fibre of the cane was, um, the, was, was fairly similar for all varieties. And that basically, uh, uh, irrespective of the variety, the main factor which determined how far you could bend a stalk before it failed, i.e. broke or, or collapsed, was its diameter. And so then he drew up a he developed a series of curves saying that the thinner the variety, the further you can bend it before it fails, and then the thicker the variety, the less you can bend it. So thinner thinner stalks, you can able to push them over more before failure than thicker thicker stalks, or also they can bend more tightly across the um, the spirals. When you get damage during this, this, this the, at the spirals. Um, that's fairly classic damage from spirals um, that then results in mutilated billets because those stalks feed up, they get cut into pieces and you have mutilated billets. Some of the work done way back by Trevor Fueling and co indicated there was a very strong relationship between the degree of lodging and billet quality, as you'd expect, 
the work we did uh, back in the late 90s um, showed that um, the more difficult the crop, the lower the, the billet quality with the OSTOF 7, the instrumented OSTOF 7000 we're using average for 100 tonne of hectare crop, we're getting about 45% sound billets. As the crop size went up, our percentage of sound billets reduced, i.e. our percentage of damage and mutilated billets increased. Um, but we also found out in that project that by improving the gathering and feeding, we were able to very significantly improve billet quality. In that project, we also ran an old Massey Ferguson prototype 405 machine and it gave dramatically better billet quality in the same crop at the same harvesting speed. So to recap, mutilated billets are predominantly the result of damage in the, at the front end and the, during the, the gathering and aligning process. Not all, not all of it, that, that, that's a big component of, of mutilated billets. And also that the, the process also causes, potentially causes a fair bit of stool damage. So feeding the crop, that's actually getting it to actually go into the throat of the harvester. The two main parts of that, that work is a knockdown with feed roller or a fin roller. So once the base cutters have chopped off the stalks, um, almost all the feed is achieved by, by these components until the stalks are in the feed train. And so the easiest way to do that is just make the knockdown and forward feed roller pretty aggressive. If we look at Santa Cruz's curves, and we put them into a, a harvester. Basically, the harvester is moving along in that direction. As it, and what we can see is that probably by before the almost a foot before the harvester base cutters have actually reached the base of the of the stalks, um, they will have been bent further than they can sort of stand. So basically, well before the um, the base cutters get there there's probably been a fair bit of damage occur. So there's another factor that occurs as well, is that these guys are rotating. And so as they've knocked that material over, they're actually pushing it down hard as well, sort of into the ground, if you like. If we look at the speed of those different components, you know, this is our knockdown roller, here's our fin roller. And we look at their speed. So if we look at our knockdown roller, this isn't a case, it's doing a bit over eight kilometres per hour. Our fin roller is doing a bit over 10 kilometres per hour. Boat. So we've got a, a stalk of cane standing there. We come along, this rollers are pushing it. They're travelling at about 10 kilometres an hour, pushing down into the ground, pushing the cane down into the ground. And so, but the other thing is, is that they're all over, the speeds are all over the place in terms of they're, they're not really matched to anything particularly well. And if you again get in, uh, get the harvester to back up, you can often find a lot of this in that you can see stalks that are both broken at ground level and broken up here a bit higher. So for example, that's the stalk there. So he's there, he's broken here and he's broken at ground level. Broken at ground level, broken up there. He's both broken there. So what's happening is that the cane's being knocked over, pushed down, and so basically it, it collapses. Now, often you don't see that in the brittle variety because the pieces just break. So again, what we can say is both the mainstream harvesters, um, basically we're bending and loading the material much more than its limits uh, well before the base cutters even get there. Some of the work Santa Cruz did um, on the damage process with base cutters, uh, what he said was, um, there are two main modes of damage, um, but the key thing out of it with current base cutter designs, really the optimum that he said was about 100 RPM per kilometre per hour was about the optimum where you minimised your damage during the base cutting process. Other work that um, we did, others have done, showed that basically there's a very strong relationship between base cutter speed and soil and cane. So under any circumstance, the lower your speed you can run your base cutters at, the lower your soil and cane will be. Um, but there are a lot of machines in the industry that have been modified by dealers and operators where the base cutters are running standard with up around 800 RPM. Uh, basically, so that they can yeah, cut the cane at high speeds. The sort of classic base cutter damage um, that we see there. Now, again, I'm saying the Crows' work. What he said is that where you've got billets like that, in fact, because of their different aerodynamic qualities, a lot of them will get sucked out. You don't actually see a lot of them. 
um, because they're sucked out by the extractor. And he estimated that in lots of circumstances, base cut losses were up to around 7% of um, total yield. There's also damage happening below the ground. So looking at now, getting into the actual project itself, what we aimed to do was um, address the major sources of damage. The fundamental hypothesis was that if we made the components operate so that they, their pit speed was matching in some way ground speed, um, that was really a first step in actually improving harvester performance. And then once we were able to do that, uh, more advanced machine interactions and then machine design could be used to actually achieve major improvements in machine performance. And that's where the SO, where the um, QUT modelling um, was to come in. So again, if we look at the standard harvester with all these components running at different speeds and all at the same speed, irrespective of your harvesting speed, um, the, the John Deere, uh, the, again, the speed drive close band, but still, yeah, same all the way through. Um, but so, our project methodology was we went to, to configure harvesters, the hydraulics on harvesters, to allow us to, to match the rotational speeds of components to ground speed in some form of an optimised relationship. Um, rather than, for example, the um, the knockdown and pin rollers having a tip speed of you know way over ground speed, we aim to set that at about 90% of forward speed. Um, and of course, we linked the base cutters so that we are aiming to um, have meet Santa Cruz's ideal of about 100 RPM per kilometre per hour forward speed. Um, we then aim to undertake the field, field program. All harvesters selected were fitted with GPS. And as I said, uh, and later in the, pro in the project, we we're aiming to incorporate the design modifications suggested by QUT and any other commercial developments that became available. So these were the four, har the four harvesters we modified. Um, and the farms where we did the actual work, the, the year of first harvest, um, the, the crop, what its configuration was, and what the status was in terms of the harvester and all that's being on, on um, GPS or not. For well, the trials for John Deere, because the components were well generally above our target speed, we were able to just reduce uh, the amount of oil going to the components at lower speed. So. The forward feed components, we had a bleed off system and we had an open center, their open center circuits, and we had an open loop control, i.e., we just told the, um, the bleed off valve how much oil to bleed off. Um, that was marginally successful. On the base cutters, we were actually, we increased pump size so we could get, we could get more base cutter speed and we electronically controlled the pump stroke in a, in a closed loop system so that, i.e., if we were doing seven kilometres per hour, we had the base cutters doing 700 RPM. And so this is then what we're aiming to get. Our, our speed, comp our components at a low, you know, at about 90% of tip speed of ground speed. During our working range, they're going up to just keeping that 90% relationship or close to it, and then the system topped out at about eight kilometres per hour. Uh, the case system was fairly complex because it's an open tended system and all the front components run off the base covers. Um, we had to bring additional oil in and so on, and it was not very successful. Uh, all the systems were controlled by electronic system. Okay, so we got into the trial program. Um, there was a common format for all trials. We're aiming for four treatments, two ground speeds, two, two base cutter front end speeds, repeated three times in random order. Each plot was four rows or six rows if the field length was less than 400 metres. And um, the, plot, the plots were maintained for the whole trial, the same plots and same treatments. So typically, for example, we might have had a, um, a high ground speed and a high base cutter speed. Uh, so that's match high four rate, a low four ground speed, a low base cutter speed. For the first year, we ran a the standard base cutter speed and a high ground speed, standard base cutter speed and a low ground speed. But then in the second year, we actually interposed them. So a low base cutter speed, high ground speed and so on, just to try and accentuate differences. 
So we measured a number of parameters, which we'll get onto shortly. One of the things though is, for example, billet damage. Um, you can look at a billet and determine sort of what was the main source of damage. And in the different trials, what we found was that in general, billet damage levels were fairly much within standard expectations of commercial machines um, in that about 50% sound billets, about another 30, 35% damaged billets, and about 15% or so mutilated billets. And that's fairly much what we expected. But what we did find was that our treatments didn't really, there are treatments on here, they didn't really make much impact. And so billet damage was within the expectations, but we certainly didn't have any big bright lights come on and say, you know, Eureka. Um, our differences, there were differences there, but they were generally um, relatively small. The next part of it, though, was um, after the harvester had harvest finished, we had our plots and we went in and we marked out these sections about 50 to 70 metres from the end of the, of the field where we went in to do these, our, our plots or in our, uh, for assessment. So typically they were either 10 metres of length of plot or 2 by 7.5 or, yeah, or metres if we were dual row and we counted both rows as separate rows. We blew the dirt off the off the row, so right down to the base cutter where the base cutters had been working, and then so we had basically the surface then that we could look at and damage. We went in. We used um, some standardised assessment of whether the billet was whether the, the butt that we could see was sound. It had edge damage. It had surface shadow. Whether it was split, deep shadow, snapped, or whether it was the whole thing was loose. Or, and later in the project, we also put a column there missing. The pre-count here was for when we went in prior to harvest and had a look at, and we counted the number of stalks again in the same 0.5 metre section. So we had our, our permanent marker in the row that we're able to go back to each year. And then we um, set in the 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1, 1 to 1.5 and so on along. Um, we, we did the assessments or the plant count or whatever. Um, what came out of that? Okay. First one here, for example, the first thing that was pretty stood out was incredibly high levels of what we would see major damage, fairly high levels of medium damage or moderate minor damage, and very, very low levels of, of undamaged or, or, or yeah, basically sound spill. So here we've got, you know, you know basically, um, well, less than 10% of what we consider undamaged or minimal damage still. And this one here was a, again, um, so the same harvest about a different crop. There are actually significantly higher levels of, of no damage. Um, this one here, again, a, yeah, a thinner variety, a, a fairly large crop. And again, very, very high levels of, of major damage, minor damage, and very, very low levels of no damage. And so what we found at all sites, at all five sites, there were very high levels of, of dual damage at all sites. There was a, a bit of a trend that the, at the, um, the matched component speeds did tend to give slightly better um, result on our assessment, but there was really not much in it. One of the key things, though, is that if you look across the five sites, um, these two crops were fairly heavily water stressed for different reasons, um, and this crop was not. And also, there was a variety effect in that um, generally our, our damage in Q240, which is a brittle variety, was actually lower than in 208. Um, after emergence, we went through a couple of times typically and did, um, did shoot counts again um, in the, um, you know, the 0.5 metre sections. And we also did biomass weight um, assessments as well of looking at average shoot weight and so on. Um, followed that through, we did pre-harvest shoot counts and so on, and then followed that through to yield. Okay, again, this is three, these three, um, Actually, none of them reached the 0.5 or the 5% statistical significance, but they're all better than 9%. Uh, so yeah, so they're almost significant. 
Uh, the other two, there's too much variation in the blocks to, to get us any effect. But this is um, the actual clean cane yields that went to the to the mill. Um, in two different plots. So in, in all of them, the, the low harvesting speed and low component speed tended to give a higher a higher delivered yield to the mill of uh, clean cane. What we found uh, actually though was that these numbers here, or those, those yields, were strongly related to our plant count and to our stalk count before harvest, but there was basically no relation or an inverse relationship with our total number of stalks after the previous harvest. And so what we tended to note is that the, the plots with the highest damage actually tended to have more shoots than the plots with less damage. The key other thing is, is just by slowing our forward speed down, we didn't get any yield response. So main lessons from the, the first main harvest on all the plots was much of the damage obser observed um, seemed to have been done before the base cutters even cut the stalk. So there was clearly a lot of sort of knockdown and gathering damage well before the base cutters get there, got there, and that is sort of as we'd expect. Generally, there was an inverse relationship between the number of shoots emerged and subsequent yield, i.e. if it was uh, more like hairs on the cat's back, um, that didn't follow through to, to higher yield in the subsequent crop. Um, but there was a strong relationship between biomass per metre along a row uh, in, the, in the harvested sections and that following through to um, to the yield of the next crop, i.e. a uh, smaller number of large, um, well-developed shoots they had a lot more biomass than a large number of small shoots. And the comments from the grower, from the harvest to drivers generally was that um, we got the, the, the lowering, the slowing down the harvesting, the harvester from front end speed tended to improve feeding. Now we had some problems with the actual open-ended speed control, but generally when we had that working well, the, the drivers very much liked it. So because of the very high levels of damage that we, we observed um, after the first harvest, what we did for the 2018 harvest was we said, okay, how do we isolate front end damage from base cutter damage? So what we did was we went in and we pre-cut sections of row at about 20 centimetres, and then we laid the cane down along in it to basically help the cane support those stalks, their stalk, the, the support the stumps. And then basically the plot was harvested um, by the harvester running at the same speed, all the other parameters the same. Uh, harvest comes along, harvest it. Now, the thing that came out of that was, okay, here's our second year, our standard treatment, 60 odd percent um, severe damage, 10%, 10%, 12%, 13% of undamaged um, stumps. Where we had pre-cut, there was a dramatic reduction in major damage and quite a good reduction, a uh, quite a good increase in the level of, of undamaged steel. Other sites, the Manus Park, Park site, again, okay, it in 2018 had very, very high levels of, um, of stool damage in the standard plot where we had pre-cut. There are still quite low levels of, um, of no damage, but there was a, a fair reduction in the levels of, of, of major damage or there was a more, yeah, there was an increase in the levels of minor damage, I guess you'd say. Uh, that plot was very heavily moisture stressed at harvest. Um, but following through, we looked at the millable stalks per metre. Then again, we weighed, hand cut and weighed the um, the plots with the, um, that had been pre-hand cut and uh, a matching plot, the plot with, um, which was not hand, was not pre-hand cut. And the source of effect we got, well, was, was this in that, okay, our different treatments, but the big difference was, the big effect was that there was an increase in yield in the plots sections that had been pre-cut. And that went through all the trial sites. So this is Childers again, you know, 60 odd percent damage, 60 damage or severe damage back 
the, with the standard harvesting regime, where we had pre-cut, we were down sort of um, in the 30s percent uh, severe damage, and again, you know, an 11 percent yield difference in, in those the average of the plot. Um, Kondong, again, a big, re, a, a, a significant reduction in severe damage, an improvement in the number of um, undamaged stools, a 13 percent yield increase. Ingham. Uh, thin variety or a very thin stalk there. We still achieved an effect of a reduction in the in the levels of severe damage, and that followed through the yield. And in fact, in those in the 12 plots there, we averaged uh, you know, 25% increase in yield. So if we do a, a summary of the data overall, we averaged about a 16% yield increase, and um, yeah, and um, some of them were not significant, others were significant, um, some were highly significant, like that one, the Demona Park was not significant, nowhere near, nowhere near significant, again, because of very high variability uh, between the replicates and so on. So basically, removing steel damage by removing the gathering and knockdown damage it didn't give us any consistent impact on, on return shoot emergence numbers. It did give us higher, but higher millable stalk numbers, and that followed through to, to proportionally higher yield yield. So, very high levels of damage to the stool we found was found after all harvesting events. The damage was clearly a combination of the gathering and feeding and base cutter effects. Reducing base cutting speed alone didn't didn't reduce or impact on yield but matching the front end components and reducing speed did. But most significantly, reducing the damage by elimination of gathering and knockdown damage did give us big improvements in yield in the, in the hand cut plot. plot. Um, then as part of the project, what we did was uh, we looked at um, modifications. Um, the QUT work on modeling for the modifications um, was having a few issues and so we looked at a couple of, um, of other modifications on harvesters to look at the effect. Um, we did fitted front end speed control to 3520 in the Rocky Point area in conjunction with modified gathering spirals, which um, had been made by EHS. And we also modified a 3520 in the Condong area to reduce the knockdown angle and, um, and also demonstrate a commercial version of the speed control system. So this is the, the first um, 3520 that was modified, and that instead of having a single spiral, a single wrap on the spirals, this machine's actually got a double wrap spirals. They're much more aggressive, and they are now linked. To the, the computer simulations worked out that, that their optimum speed was about 16 RPM per kilometer per hour, or about 64 RPM at, at four kilometers per hour. Um, and we had these guys running at about 70% of ground speed, and we had a full com full com feedback system in involved place so that if the computer was telling the system to run at 64 RPM, that's what it ran at. What came out of that was that machine demonstrated a dramatic improvement in in feed in large crop large crops relative to the standard machine. It was able to harvest green crops over 200 tons of a hectare, which was never possible with the standard machine. So the combination of matching spirals to ground speed and the more aggressive spirals very dramatically improved the the performance of that machine. We didn't do billet quality assessment, but billet quality was, was observed to be very good on that machine. On a machine at Condong, um, the machine had been relegated to be a plant cutter. What we did is we moved the fin roller from down here up here. So basically then our components basically matched Crozer's curves. So we repositioned that roller, we removed that guy, and basically complied with, with Crozer's curves. We moved the cross half rollers up, and um, yeah, took out the adjustable there, and yeah, relocated him. Um, unfortunately, due to the field conditions, we weren't able to do an assessment of stool damage, but we were able to do an assessment, of, a good assessment of billet damage. And in the same, same field, same everything, same section of the field, comparing the standard 570, the new machine, versus the modified machine, we had a very dramatic reduction 
bozo protein at the same period, we had a very dramatic reduction in billet damage. And so that again implies that we're doing a lot less um, damage to, to the stalk and um, from previous work, probably a lot less damage to the, to the stool as well. Okay, um, that machine did perform well in the, the main crop, which is 125 tonnes of hectare, but in larger sections of the crop near drains and so on, where the crop was over 200 tonnes of hectare, it was barely functional, whereas the standard machine still ate it. Uh, the, um, right, further work was required to enhance you know, the whole feed, but, um, but what we did demonstrate was that you can reduce damage. Going back to some work we did back in the late 90s with um, the machine we used to call Beetle, um, what it showed is, well, well, we set it up to, to meet Santa Cruz's curves there in terms of knockdown and so on. And that machine had very, very aggressive feed and was able to operate very successfully in large lodge crops um, and still had very high bullet quality. So, dual and stalk damage is clearly a problem with current harvest of front end designs and there are significant industry gains possible by rectification of this. The biggest initial gains will come from modifications to the, the front end, the things like the position of the um, managing knockdown, optimising component speeds and so on. But to get the big gains of the future, we really need the, the whole modelling work that was done by QUT to get to the next level. So further significant gains will then be possible, um, but all that really needs you know, is uh, needs basically to harvest the harvest of front end speed to be matchable to ground speed and so on to get those benefits. Uh, there'll also be side benefits of things like reduced soil and cane and so on. We know that. Um, so we can say it's reasonable to expect that machine modifications that facilitate better machine crop interactions will give demonstrable gains with respect to damage in the crop field during harvest, i.e., if we do this, we can expect. You know, a better uh, commercial yields uh, into the return crops. And <clears throat> yeah, and so all those the positive benefits. Um, a key thing is that this work won't be done by the manufacturers. If you look at the, the, the basic markets for harvesters, Australia is one of a very few number of sophisticated markets. Most markets that harvesters are going into, including Brazil, are very unsophisticated with respect to all this. And so therefore it's up to advanced industries like Australia to present the data and to, to do the work, present the data and technical knowledge to allow adoption by the manufacturers. Um, the, the manufacturer skills are making reliable machines rather than really understanding machine crop interactions. And finally, like acknowledgements to everybody who helped us the project. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks very much, Chris. Now I'm just going to attempt to do a few things. I'm going to put, um, hopefully that is actually the link to the uh, report. So I've just put that into the chat. Hopefully you can all see that now. It should work as a link, um, but if you have any trouble accessing it, I'm doing a few things on the run here. So that's also just added into the chat. Uh, the email address for our library the, uh, support if you need any assistance with accessing uh, a copy of the report or a copy of any other of our reports. And one more link I'm just going to put into the chat. And um, just with these links, you can come back and access them at any time. So you don't have to open them today. But if you come back to this meeting down the track, you they should be still there for you in the chat. Um, so that uh, final one. Um, is actually just uh, to uh, sorry, just to a survey that um, would really appreciate your feedback on the webinar. The survey will take about two minutes to complete, so you can do it um, at any time. I'll leave it open, you know, sort of maybe till Monday or so. I imagine after that, probably nobody's going to come back and do it. Um, but if you could do that, that would be really great. Um, so to the questions, I, I noticed that uh, somebody did have their hand up uh, a little while ago, so. Uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Warren. I'm not sure, Malcolm, do you have a question or um, or was that just a hand up? I'm not sure. If, if, you are, and if you are asking a question, you might be still on mute. All right, maybe not. 
All right, does anyone else have a question? Oh, we've got a couple of questions. Okay, so um, Robert, who I saw yeah. speak last week at, um, at NextGen. So Robert, thank you for joining us. Um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Chris, uh, have, have you tried any variations of base cutter height between left and right so that the cane's not getting cut, flicking backwards and forwards on each side? Uh, yeah, it's probably the width of the blade at baser. Um, no, no, we, we basically just used the harvester with the standard configuration. We did make sure that the, the base cutter blades were either new or very good condition when we did the harvesting the trials. So in fact, if you start looking, comparing our results with um, standard field trial or standard harvesting operations, we're probably on the better side because we knew the base cutter blades were, were sharp and new. Um, but no, we just, we didn't, you know, it was a very much a macro event, if you like, just looking at, at the overview. There's the standard harvest of the standard blades, and um, that is the result we got. Thanks, Chris. I can't see any other hands up or any other questions. Has anyone else got something they would like to ask, Chris? If I could, please. Uh, Look, I, I was on a call the other day to some Central American people. Chris, uh, they said, is the, and I don't know where this 2.3 kilometres an hour come from, but they said, should we be harvesting at 2.3 kilometres an hour? I said, well, we can't afford to go that slow, uh, except cutting plants, I suppose. Are, are you coming up with a, yeah, I know you said the, the crop dividers, and I guess the driver can have a look at that and see when it started to fold up in front of him. But uh, look, this 2.3 kilometres, where'd that all come from? And uh, is it a fallacy? I, uh, yeah, I, I've been to lots of places in Central America where they've been harvesting at two and a half kilometres an hour and so on. And the machines are feeding terribly. In fact, by increasing your speed up to you know 4K an hour at least or something, you actually get the machine to feed a lot better and you do a better job and you do less damage. Uh, at one mill, we did some. We actually did some base cutter damage assessment, and there was less damage at four k an hour, after, or three and a half to four, than there was at the two and a half. And, and that sort of makes sense. If you've got all those components at the front doing ten k an hour, trying to spear the cane into the you know, into the machine and all the rest, you're going to be doing a lot of damage. Um, and, and again, that comes then to when you actually start then bringing that those speed tip speeds down to something like. The speed you actually want the material the material to go into the harvest rack will you, you'll reduce damage further so yeah I, I know there's that low super low speed is is a big thing in central america but um it doesn't have too many benefits from what i can see thanks chris <laughs> uh chris there's one question being added into the chat from craig uh just asking whether the fields were 1.5 metre row spacing and whether you mentioned that. He, he missed that if you had um, addressed that. Oh, no, sorry, yeah, um, we made a couple of decisions. Um, the aim was, well, there was, a, there was one field at 1.6, 1.65. All the others were either 1.9 or 1.83. What we were aiming to do was try and minimise um, the effects of other things like soil compaction, uh, you know, wheels against the row and so on. So basically, by having the harvesters on GPS, we were aiming to be able to have the harvester sitting square on the row, so that essentially it was just base cutter effects we we're looking at. Um, and yeah, so that, that's why there would be a mainly 1.83 or 1.9. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Uh, Luciano. Would you like to go ahead? We can't hear you. I'm not sure if you're on mute or whether you didn't intend to ask a question. Uh, no, I was muted. Um, were the crops mainly standing or laying down when you uh, harvested the, the trials? It, it varied. Some some were standing, some were um, were 
heavy, fairly heavily lodged, like for example the Wilma, the um, the Mona Park crop was fairly heavily lodged. Um, some of the others were lodged for the first crop and then standing after that. So th there was a range, uh, a range there. Most of the crops were standing by by the uh, yeah, certainly by the second harvest. Just an, an observation. Uh, when my came, he um, encountered a situation where there were very very long stalks in the cane, and most of the harvesters couldn't cut the cane. He modified his harvester to push the spirals about half half a metre further forward and stand them up and was successful in harvesting that that crop. Um, have any tests been done on the position of the spirals and the orientation? Uh, one of the old rules of thumb used to be in a harvest is that you needed to have two thirds of the stalk um, in the machine basically before the base cutters cut it. And um, I guess what you're saying there is that if you've got a super long stalk it's going to be lodged. It's going to be, um, you know, difficult to feed, and so that length does become important. However, the the better the spirals interact with that cane, the better you, yeah, you, know, you will be able to feed it. And I would sort of probably say that, um, you know, modified spirals and you know, like the EHS ones or what we did with the rocket, what Steve did with the Rocky Point machine, would probably uh, have very significantly helped. Uh, the machine feed in that situation. I, I can see that there's a hand up from someone at night. I don't have the, the name. It's it's coming up for me as Racecourse Projects George. So whoever that is, if you'd like to ask your question now. Chris, how are you going, mate? Thanks for your presentation this morning. Um, just a quick question around, uh, you were talking before about sort of base cutter RPM. Did you do any work around, more around tip, the relationship of tip speed and hard surfacing on base cutter blades in regard to billet damage? Uh, no, George, that's a whole big area by by itself. Uh, essentially, we just used um, standard standard blades, um, but yeah, in in good new condition. We do know, yeah, from work that's been done, and even Alan Hurley guys a long time ago did a lot of work on on blunt versus sharp base cutter blades, and what they found was that um, yeah, there was a a big increase in damage. <clears throat> now, um, but we know in all this work that the conditions after harvest make a big difference. Like you can sometimes mutilate the crop and you'll get a, you know, a good return back if, if the conditions are right after harvest, whereas the harsher the conditions, the less damage the crop will tolerate. And, um, you know, so, so I guess the thing with hard facing is that it allows you to keep a, a better edge longer, but often there's, um, if, the, if the thickness of the blade goes up too much, you're going to be doing a lot more damage there anyway as well. So it, it, it's a big area, um, as is things like cutting height is a big area as well. Um, this That was not part of this project. I guess what we looked at here was, you know, the, again, the um, gathering, feeding, base cutter damage in the standard configuration. And back. And there's another question in the chat, Chris. Uh, do you have the side trim blades removed during these tests? Uh, yes, side trim blades were not used. Um, again, if you have to use side trim blades, you've admitted defeat in that your your um, your get your spirals and that are not able to gather the crop. So if you're running uh, side trim blades, um, the crop's too big. You know, your, your spirals aren't doing their job. I can't see another. Oh, okay. So we're having trouble failing to load that PDF. All right. Um, what I'll do is I'll check that link and I can uh, re-add a, a correct link to this chat and I'll also add it to the um, the page on the website when the webinar is uploaded. So when we add the recording to the website, I can add the links there. 
Uh, and I, uh, there's also a, a fairly recent um, Kane connection, uh, sorry, uh, Kane Clips video that I'll add the link uh, as well so that it should be all available on, on the website, probably within the, uh, today or tomorrow, they'll be available, those links. But it may be a browser issue, apparently someone's just messaged me, so it could be perhaps try a different browser. So if you're in Chrome, try Firefox or if you're in Edge, try Chrome, something like that. Are there any other questions? Oh, it doesn't look like it. All right. Um, well, thank, thanks very much, Chris, for that. And thanks to everyone for attending um, today's webinar. We hope that you found it of value. Um, if you've got any additional feedback on top of the, the survey that I've put, put uh, sorry, that I've added in, um, to the chat. If you've got any additional feedback, um, please feel free to email me. Um, my contact details are in the event information uh, are currently on the website. Our next webinar is scheduled for the 16th of March and it's titled Plant Pathogens Meet a Novel Class of Magnetic Nanozymes for Plant Disease Diagnostics and there's some more information about that on our website. Uh, we've got some other webinars in the pipeline and these will be coming up advertised on our website shortly. We also put them on our social media platforms. So if you're on Facebook, LinkedIn or Twitter or all three, um, you'll see notifications for those. And we also send out email <coughs> invitations. So if, you're, if you'd like to receive email notifications um, of webinars, please get in contact with me and I can make sure that your uh, details are added to the distribution list. Uh, thanks again and um, have a good day, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.